Matty Norman uh, from Mundulla in South Australia, from the southeast part near Bordertown. And uh, Matty is uh, just an exciting and really passionate guy. Look forward to him. Thank you for the introduction, Andrew, and the congratulations on the appointments. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Neumann, and I'm going to talk to you today about farm-driven marketing. I'm looking at a primary producer's guide to increasing farm gate returns. Some of my fellow alumni suggested to me that the, my title of my topic would make a good election promise. It's uh, <laughs> got plenty of hope, but whether it will deliver, we'll find out in about 12 minutes. <laughs> Before I get started, I'd like to uh, extend my gratitude to my sponsor, Rabobank. Thank you for the support over the last two years, and I believe the representative Steve Kelly is here today, so thank you, Steve. So just a bit of brief background about our farm. We farm 320 hectares, about 22 kilometres west of Boartown in the upper southeast of South Australia. 120 hectares is irrigated by Senate Pivot, and I farm with my wife, Janine, and our two boys, Ethan and Ryder. Our business consists of about 67 hectares of irrigated lucent for seed and hay production, a cropping program and a prime lamb operation. And we grow potatoes for the fresh market in a family operation, with 80% going to Coles and Woolworths through an intermediary and 20% to a direct market. And my, our potato operations been the focus of my study. So I had a great time studying and travelling with a great group of guys. And you know, what can I say? They're, they're, they're some of the best guys I've ever, ever met and they uh, put a pretty solid program together. So we had to make, be productive in every way we possibly could to make the most of our breaks. So let's get a look at our current economic climate as, as uh, producers. John F. Kennedy sums it up very pertinently where he says, the farmer is the only man in our, our economy who buys everything retail, sells everything at wholesale and pays the freight both ways. <laughs> and in the last five to 10 years, we've seen increasing and more volatile input costs with our fuel and fertilizer coupled to the, the oil price and also electricity with prices increasing at 15% year on year. As an irrigator, our electricity costs make up between 10 and 30% of our overall operating costs. So it is quite considerable. Coupled with that, we've seen a further consolidation in our marketplace. Woolworths and Coles have over 80% market share in retail groceries. And in terms of global revenue, Woolworths is currently 17th and West Farmers or Coles 18th in, in that revenue, both bringing in around $50 billion a year. To put that into an Australian context, we, we equate to about 0.4 of a percent of the global population. So we are operating in one of the most uh, consolidated markets in the world. So for suppliers like myself, what, what does consol consolidation mean? It means lower returns and tighter product specifications. So to my topic, farmer-driven marketing. I, I believe the key to understanding opportunities in our, in our uh, farming um, businesses is to look at value chains. Now this, this definition here, an alliance of enterprises collaborating vertically to achieve a more rewarding position in the marketplace is a, a definition of what a value chain should be used. And when I began my study with Nuffield, I believe that a supply chain and value chain were one and the same thing. But on my travels around the world and speaking with many individuals, I came to the realisation that there is a real succinct difference between the two. If we look at supply chains, it's a, a production focused model. It's looking at producing as much as we can for a low cost, and then we push that volume of product onto the next, next link of that chain. And quite often we see in, in times where our supply out, out does um, demand, we see, um, at, for an example, when, we are, when we're at harvest time with our grains that are into the silos or in the peak land selling season, we see, see our prices fall away dramatically and us becoming a price taker. Whereas the value chain is all about the consumer. A value chain is about creating value along each link of that chain so that a consumer is the benefit of, of a, a product that they can't resist. So instead of pushing as a supply chain, we've got a pull mechanism taking place. So for myself, there's two options going forward. I can look to gain an economy of scale and become a bulk commodity producer, try and limit my inputs, maximise my output, and use technological advances and innovation to try and achieve this. 
or I can look to def differentiate my product through leveraging opportunities in my product's value chain. And this is the focus of my study. So here we have a, one of the main keys to gaining value in our value chain. Product differentiation, it comes in many forms, and today I'm just focusing on the marketing and varietal forms. So with our, what we have here on the left is a nice little pink carton that housed fresh new season baby potatoes. It was put together by a company called um, British Columbia Fresh, and I came across this when I was in uh, Edmonton in Canada. Now, BC Fresh, what they did was this market research, so who was their main consumer? What was the demographic that they needed to chase? And it was the females between 29 and 44. So as you can see, they've got the beautiful pink colour, little pretty pictures on the side, and comments saying, these potatoes were lovingly showered and brushed dry for your convenience. <laughs> If we look to the, the following picture of the Kestrel potato, the point of difference with this potato is its purple blush. It's quite prominent and it's a good all-round eating potato. It cooks well, it's got a good texture and it's a good potato to, to, to grow as well. So what, what we've seen in the potato industry with the fresh, loose, white wines is a lot of substitution in the past where four or five varieties will be sold as a fresh, loose, white potato. But each of these varieties have different traits and characteristics. Some cook well, some taste well, good. Others are very poor in all three. So the Kestrel really stands above in its ability to, to be a good all-rounder and you know what you're getting first time and every time. And it's growing dramatically in market share. The next step is understanding our consumer. There's a saying by David Ogilvy, a UK advertiser. <laughs> is that the consumer, the consumer isn't a moron, she is your wife. And uh, we all know the saying that the consumer is always right. <laughs> so what are some of the trends that we, we look into when we try to understand our consumer? The number one trend that I saw on travels around the world was convenience. Our consumer in this day and age has less time to go to the supermarkets to purchase their items. They have less time to prepare a healthy meal for themselves and their families. And wherever I went, the fastest growing product that I saw was the, the pre-packaged, ready to heat and serve type meal. Second, another consumer trend was an online selling platforms. Web-based web, web marketing, um, marketing systems put together by supermarkets and uh, business as well. And a great example of that was in San Francisco, I visited a, in central San Francisco, I visited a company called Good Eggs. And they facilitated the transfer of organic produce between the producer and the consumer. That was all done within a 24-hour process. They only took a small commission and the, the producer was enabled to put their price on the product of what they wanted to charge for it. Very successful business. Thirdly, another trend is aesthetics is a proxy for quality. And we suffered at the hands of this trend in the potato industry for many years. To give you an instance, uh, last season, between a first grade and a second grade potato, with the only difference being its aesthetics appeal, we saw a price differential of 400%. And lastly, farmers markets are buying local. It is a growing trend, it's, it's grown re remarkably in the UK and the US, particularly California, but we're seeing it starting to move forward in Australia as well. Consumers are starting to look for a nutrient dense product, they want to know the history and about its food safety. And a great example of that was Uncle Henry's Farm Shop in Yorkshire, UK. A potato grower had gone from growing 400 acres of potatoes down to 40 and instead diversified his income flow by creating a farm shop. He invested over a million pounds to set up some outhouses on his farm and create a state-of-the-art cafe. He was selling over 1,300 limes at this farm shop and the, the significance in this business was that he, even in the UK, his closest town was still 20 miles away from him. So people, the consumer was willing to travel to get fresh produce and to know where it came from. So some further trends was Branson Potato Packers UK, one of the UK's biggest potato packers, main supplier of supermarket Tesco's. And they packed potatoes from a 20 kilogram carton for the, the food service industry down to four potatoes in a clear package uh, ready for the average day consumer. <coughs> when talking with their representatives, about what was their main seller, what was their main line that, that uh, they moved, they said 40% of overall volume moved through their shed was that four pack of potatoes. The consumer is leaning towards 
leaning towards going to the supermarket two or three times and doing smaller shops each time. And in Australia, only 37% of consumers will go and do a weekly food shop. Also in Country Crest, the business in Ireland, they grow and pack of potatoes and onions and they also diversified into a large range of heat and serve meals. And there you can see a picture of a baked potato, seasoned, garnished, ready to heat and, and then put on the, on the plate. When we spoke with the executives, we were quite impressed with the business model, but when speaking with, with the owners and the managers in, within Country Crest, they, they said to us, because they were dealing with the retail chains in the UK, they were working on only a margin of 4%. So that really reiterates to me that the key to a value chain and, and gaining a bigger economic return is gaining as much control as we can along our value chain. And here's another consumer trend. Picture yourself in a train platform in Seoul, South Korea. We have a commuter here waiting to board his train, and while he's waiting, he's using a QR, uh, QR code reader to scan the grocery items he'd like delivered to his uh, house the following morning. How can we as producers try and tap into this growing trend and into this generation Y type mentality? So bringing it back to an Australian context, we're a very unique country in many ways. And some of our challenges going forward as producers is our low population density and our large distances between what, where we grow our product to where it's then sold. One of the keys I believe we need to look at to overcome this is vertical integration. And a great example of this here is uh, British Chlorophyll, part of Blankney Estates in Lincolnshire, UK. You see the two directors up there standing proudly. They've got a great business where they, with their chlorophyll production. They use perennial grasses and leucine then they squeeze the chlorophyll out, as you can see with the pellets on the bottom picture, one with the chlorophyll still attached and one with it drawn out. And then they on sell to the pharmaceutical companies and healthcare sector. A very high value product that's exported around the world. Another managed market strategy we can look at is collaborative market partnerships, both formally and informally. I really believe as Australian agriculturalists, we've had a competitive mentality that we're all competing for the same in one market. In my opinion, I believe we need to look at having a collaborative approach. How can we work together to offset the consolidation in our marketplace? Whether it's in the form of a joint venture or in a cooperative partnership or even on a larger scale. I believe that's an avenue that we need to explore and all those producers need to take that collaborative mindset. Thirdly, and perhaps the most riskiest option, is to create a consumer-driven product. And what I mean by that is going out into the marketplace looking at what the consumer's trends are now, what they're going to do in the next five to ten years, and look where the gaps are. Where is the consumer not getting what they, they need and deserve? And then it's about creating a product to fill that gap and creating a value chain all the way back to the paddock. This is perhaps, as I said, the most riskiest, but it's got the highest potential of return. And there is opportunities out there to create this type of product. So outcomes from myself and my industry is I believe there's a real opportunity to explore new seasons baby potatoes here in Australia. I believe it's an undeveloped market. We have the ability now to maintain yields with new management practices. And with a short growing season, we can negate the heat stress that's such an issue on our summer crop. In my opinion, I believe branding and package size is the key to success for this to succeed. And this type of business model encompasses vertical integration. If it's successful moving forward, you can look at a collaborative structure to maintain supply. And I believe it is a product that's meeting a hole in the market that could meet that hole. So another thing I came across in the back shed of a, of a potato uh, washing facility in the UK was a 3D indoor growing system. Now this system is used to grow leafy greens and herbs and microgreens. It has an ability to grow 80 plants over 8 square feet. It does a full rotation every 45 minutes. And the thing that, the issue that I, I think is given it the most potential is an ability to put model systems vertically. I see this as a, a potential opportunity in our environment we, for the ability to put a system like this, multiple units in empty warehouse space close to our distribution centres and our end users, negating the effect of freight um, that they are produced to the market and also keeping freshness at a maximum. So I'd just like to acknowledge and thank my family, Janine, Ethan and Ryder, for being by my side and your continual support throughout the last two years. To my parents, Eddie and Beth, 
the managing my farm and doing such a great job of it while I was away. To my June, July 2012 Global Focus Program colleagues, it's been an absolute privilege for me to be able to travel with you and talk and discuss the things that we've seen and the experiences that we've had, thank you. And to Nuffield Australia, to Terry, to Jim, to the board, I just indebted to you for the, the opportunity that and, uh, and yeah, confidence that you've showed in me. And finally, to Rabobank, thank you again for your sponsorship and your continued support of Nuffield. Thank you very much.